I'm Cookie Miller, and this is Worth the Wait. Join me every week as I explore profound weight loss solutions beyond just diet and exercise, because a lifestyle change starts with changing your mind. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Worth the Wait. I'm your host, Cookie Miller, and today we are talking about bariatric weight loss surgery, and we have a very, very special guest. So I am so excited to introduce the lovely Alyssa Tyler. Alyssa is a registered and licensed dietitian. She is the owner of Alyssa Noel Nutrition. She specializes in functional nutrition and metabolic adaptation caused by hormone, thyroid, and gut disorders. She spent the first part of her career in the Cleveland Clinic in the bariatric surgery and general nutrition wings for three years, um, after which she transferred and transitioned into integrative medicine for three years before branching out on her own. She has been an RD for the past seven years in the field, and she's currently studying to be a functional practitioner. So I am so excited to introduce my friend, my mentor, um, Alyssa Tyler. So she is going to send us a little request to join, and then we're going to let her in. Just so you guys know, we have some questions that are already set up for Alyssa. And then if you have submitted your question, we also have that question that we'll go over. And there she is. Hello. I got to like come down a little bit. I'm going to come off. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Feeling a lot better today. So things are good. Good. I'm happy to yeah. hear that. Yeah. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, for those of, of you who don't know, last week I made a post that kind of got some feedback, <laughs> um, you know, and things like that. These are touchy subjects. We're talking about weight loss. We're talking about yeah. nutrition and people's choices and their health. And that can be very touchy. Um, so it's to be expected. But on my platform, I want to make sure that I'm always presenting information that is well researched and information that is true. Um, and accurate. And I knew that there'd be no better person <laughs> to help me with this topic than you. So um, I think I misspoke there for a bit too, because you worked in the Cleveland Clinic, but was that for the three years or was that longer? No, Cleveland Clinic was my, my very first job out of school. So where I had started specifically was, you know, in a, in a pretty difficult field in bariatric nutrition, which has a lot to learn in that field. So I worked there initially. And then after about six months or so, so my, my stint was short in bariatric care. I learned a ton, but it was after that, that I transitioned more into like integrative health, functional medicine. And that's kind of what started me interested more in that field. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a heck of a way to get into it. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, dive right in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bariatric weight loss surgery is definitely a hot topic. It's something that I hear a lot, um, mm -hmm. especially I'm working with a ton of people who have a lot of weight to lose. So most of my yeah. clients have anywhere between like at a minimum, sometimes 50 pounds and mm -hmm. up to over 100 pounds. Absolutely. So these are people who are definitely considering weight loss surgery. It's something that I considered before I started my journey. I was like, is there, you know, is there another way that I can do this? Because I tried yeah. so many times. So can you describe to us the different types of bariatric weight loss surgery and how each one of them leads to weight loss? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good place to start. Um, and there's a lot of criteria depending on if a person is actually a good candidate for weight loss surgery, we don't, at, at least in the reputation of the Cleveland Clinic, we did not accept everyone. It was a very, very strict protocol that we went through to make sure that that person was going to be right to have that surgery. So that person, I'll just, I'm just going to talk about this first because I think this is important before we dive into the two different types of surgery that I saw most often. Yeah. So they either had to be a hundred pounds over what their ideal body weight should be. Um, so we would sit with them. We would figure out, you know, based on your height, based on your lifestyle, what is a, what's, a, what's an ideal weight for you? 
And we would see, okay, are they drastically over that point? So that was one criteria. Second criteria was whether or not their body fat was indicative. Their body mass index, their body fat, was that in a dangerous position causing them to be labeled as obese or morbidly obese? So usually where this falls into line is 35, BMI of 35, 440. If someone had a BMI of 35, which is not uncommon, you know, there's people that are in the bodybuilding industry that yeah. have BMI that are very close to that. <laughs> exactly. Um, that had to be paired with a lot of comorbidities. So mm. I wouldn't just see individuals that had high BMIs. They also had diabetes. They also had sleep apnea. They also had a lot of joint pain, heart failure risk or heart disease mm. risk. Like there was a lot of comorbidities that correlated which made them a better candidate for that surgery. This isn't yeah. just about weight loss. This is making sure that your risks for getting disease are drastically reduced. And that was what made those people more ideal candidates in that situation was like, wow, if they have an increased risk for diabetes or having heart disease, let's absolutely give this a shot if this can make them less susceptible to have it. So yeah. we needed to make sure that the patient understood that not only is this a serious surgery to go through that's invasive and comes with complications after we need to make sure what surgery is going to be best for them and that leads us into the few different types that i would see so at the cleveland clinic we had kind of gone away with doing gastric band procedures that okay. was probably like one of the most common first getting started into bariatric surgery procedures that was done. And a lot of those individuals that had gastric bands, because it is a reversible procedure, would show up in my office wanting gastric sleeve or the full mm. gastric bypass because it didn't work as effectively. If you're putting a band around your stomach, there's the ability for that band to expand and that person is right back where they started. Yeah. So gastric sleeve, both of, both of these surgeries honestly take a very minimal amount of time. The surgery itself is about an hour to an hour and a half, but the type of surgery that you have, so gastric sleeve, and I have notes in front of me just so that you guys know, cause I have not been in this field for about seven years. So I wanted to make sure <laughs> I got my, my facts right. Yeah. <laughs> a gastric sleeve, is basically they are reducing the size of your stomach to about the size of a banana. They're taking wow. like a lot of your stomach out. They're making it a very small amount, which of course is translating into less food that you can eat. So right. it's not as invasive. The recovery is less. Patients lose weight at a slower, steadier weight with having this surgery. But after a year, you can expect to lose about 60 to 70% of whatever wow. excess weight you have. So when we would sit and meet with clients, we would figure out, all right, based on where your ideal weight is, how much excess weight are you carrying? Is this a realistic goal for you? You know, if someone's coming into my office and they're only 70 pounds overweight, and they want to lose more than that, not a realistic surgery to have. Right. So less ability to eat a lot of food. That's the point of the gastric sleeve. So gotcha. lower risk of a lot more complications that we see with gastric bypass. Um, there's a less risk for dumping syndrome, which is a very, very common thing that I see with the surgery. That's when the contents of the stomach empty too quickly into your intestines and it causes nausea, it causes vomiting in some cases. You kind of think of the symptoms of like heartburn or anything mm -hmm. related to the esophagus, it's coming back up. You know, if you're completely yeah. reorganizing the structure of your stomach and intestines and digestive tract, there is risk of things regurgitating and coming back out of your system. And if individuals are not taught to eat appropriately and they're used to eating really fast and they're used to yeah. eating a large quantity of food, there's the risk for that to come right back up. So gastric sleep does present, prevent that from happening as frequently as gastric bypass. Gotcha. Gastric bypass is also known as root and Y. 
the Y shape is important because that goes along with like the restructuring of the digestive tract. So basically they create like a little pouch out of your stomach and they take like a Y shaped of the intestines and they attach it to that pouch. So what this is doing is not only creating a very small amount that that person can eat, like we're talking like two tablespoons of food at a time and then they get full. Whoa. Now you are bypassing, hence the name of the surgery, you're bypassing the stomach and you are bypassing the first two parts of the intestine, the duodenum and the jejunum. So if we think about how digestion happens and nutrient absorption to happen, which is vital in the very first part of that process, the stomach and the very first part of the small intestine, yeah. there's such a danger in malnutrition after that surgery because we're just not giving the body what it needs in terms of enzymes and certain support. And so post-nutrition care is so incredibly important. And we'll talk more about that. But there's increased complications from this surgery. There's increased risk of dumping syndrome. Usually weight loss does happen in the first year to year and a half and it's 60 to 80% of excess weight. So it is effective. Um, and this is going to be a more effective surgery for reducing all those comorbidities that we discussed before, like the sleep apnea and the diabetes. It's just more invasive and more effective at doing that. For someone that's like, I don't have a lot of weight to lose and I don't have a lot of comorbidities, gastric sleeve. For someone that is a BMI of 40 and they have a lot of health risks, then usually gastric bypass was their answer. Wow. I had absolutely no idea about the two tablespoons of food. Like, mm -hmm. at a time that is so crazy. And so it's just completely redirecting everything and you correct. you don't get a chance to go through that actual process of digestion where all of your nutrients absorb properly they go through your stomach go through the stomach yeah. acid all of that exactly exactly yeah. so yeah if you think about how much stomach space there actually is when you're creating a pouch now you're talking like the size of a golf ball two tablespoons is going to be very easy to fill that up whereas right. the gastric sleeve it's more banana so yeah. you have a little bit more room to fill up and get some, some more than two tablespoons. Yeah, but yeah, it is. It's it's mind blowing, and that's where my role came in as a dietitian in making sure that they were aware of the risks and how right. their diet is going to have to change after the surgery. Like that is the most important part. And so, and you and I were talking a little bit about this. So many different insurances have different guidelines to get someone able to have this surgery. Yeah. So I saw individuals in my office that their insurance only required one visit with a dietitian. I oh saw some God. that were as long as six months. So wow. there was a huge difference. I'm not comfortable with having someone in my office one time giving them all the rundown of what the surgery does and the complications and we're only talking in a one hour visit wow. that that was dangerous to me granted cleveland clinic you had to see me or another dietitian you had to see the surgeon and medical staff and you had to see a psychologist so if mm -hmm. someone was seeing me for months before the surgery they were also seeing all those other disciplines at the same time. And yeah. that was important because we as a care team needed to make sure that that person was in the right mindset, was receiving the education, was actively working on bettering their nutrition, focusing on how can I control weight loss naturally through diet and exercise while I have the accountability and show that they were good. They were, they were understanding all that the surgery would entail. And I even had some people back out of the surgery, you know, wow. because they're working with me, they're seeing benefit from losing weight. And it's like, wow, I don't need this. Yeah, I'm able to yeah. do this on my own. So it's, wow. it's a really neat thing. It yeah. I don't want to bad talk it because I, I saw a lot of fantastic outcome from having the mm -hmm. surgery. 
for those that were most adherent, but knowing the risks, going to the right hospital system, having a staff that's very, very careful about informing you of everything is so important. Yeah, it sounds like it really depends on quite a few factors. I mean, one, it's going to depend on your mindset coming into it in the beginning. You know, yeah. your mindset has to be around a lifestyle change and not just focus on the weight loss. Correct. Um, but it also depends on your insurance, which mm -hmm. is that's the crazy fact that you presented. So your insurance and what they require and then also where you go. The different Correct. there are different places that you can go and they all have different requirements. It sounds like yeah. the Cleveland Clinic was one of the good ones, but it sounds like there yeah. are some that maybe don't require enough. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring that up because so I was hired on with the Cleveland Clinic as PRN. So I mean I was still working like thirty eight hours a week, but I wanted to interview with other hospitals because I loved, I loved bariatric care. I wanted a full-time position in it. And when I went to, so I'm originally from Cleveland, Akron isn't too far from me. I went to another city in Ohio to interview with their hospital. And it was very different, their mm. approach in how they would handle patients. I cannot remember, I think it was OptiFast. I think they were making clients do OptiFast prior to the surgery. Wow. And they had asked me like, are you familiar with this method? And I wasn't and I researched more into it. And that, that steered me away from that facility. I turned down that job because I did not believe in what they were making clients do prior to the surgery. They weren't teaching them healthy methods about <laughs> eating. We're not just trying to get clients to rapidly lose weight because that's not going to work. If they go in with the mindset of this is a quick fix surgery, they're going in with the wrong mindset. That's going to land them in my office a year after they have that surgery in the same exact place that yeah. they were in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that you said that. I mean, if the, if there is not a lifestyle change, no matter which route you take, whether you lose weight naturally, because I also don't want to, I think that was what a lot of people kind of took offense to that. I was maybe, you know, talking down about the surgery, but it's not about mm -hmm. that. It's about the education that needs to go with it. Correct. You know, people have to make educated choices and whether you're losing weight naturally or with the surgery, if you do not make the lifestyle adjustment, you will find yourself back in the same place. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's just it's, of course, a more serious decision when you do decide to do the surgery, whether it's the RNY or the sleeve, because now you don't you are missing a part of your body like that's a big deal. So can you talk a little bit about what happens with that as far as malabsorption, which is what the original post was about? Yeah, of course. So when we think about that, there's restructure to our digestive system. And that's so important because we need that space in order for vitamin absorption to occur. After the surgery, someone has to supplement. You have to supplement for life. Like this is mm. not... This is not an option. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's certain vitamins and nutrients, and I'm just going to read off the ones that are absolutely required after surgery. So when we think about we're reducing the quantity of food that someone's eating, the number one thing that we need to replace it with is a multivitamin. If mm -hmm. we're only able to eat so much, do we think we're going to get the RDA of all the vitamins and minerals that we should be eating? you're getting no absolutely not <laughs> so when clients have this surgery they need to take double the dose of a standard multivitamin and most often i start in individuals with like flintstones chewables two mm. chewables every day the chewables were good they were able to get into the system immediately provide double the dose of what they needed and that's something they have to continue. So it guarantees that that person is getting all the micronutrients that they need in order to get what they're lacking from the foods that they cannot get in the quantity that they need. So multivitamin mm -hmm. and mineral support. Um, so usually I would use che chewables. Sometimes it was liquid adult multivitamins. So whatever source, that's, that's what they had to do. B12. So B12 is something that is produced in our stomach. 
B12 is needed to digest protein. So they'd have to take a thousand micrograms, either a tablet or sublingually, or get B12 injections. B12 helps with not only digesting protein, it's associated with anemia. If you don't have high amounts of it, it helps with blood cell and nerve function. So it helps so much with everything. And we're missing that yeah. when we're bypassing the stomach completely. We're not getting B12 to digest our proteins. Yeah. Um, the next thing is iron. So, and the dosage would depend. Um, we would obviously run panels, see where their iron was to begin with but usually they had to take somewhere around 45 to 60 milligrams of iron paired with vitamin c because vitamin c is going to increase the absorption of iron um, and this is vital to the formation of red blood cells also make sure that we're providing oxygen to the entire body so we've got b12 we've got a multivitamin we've got iron and then the last thing that we need to make sure oh <laughs> Hi, sweetie. She's like, I want to be on camera. <laughs> she I she wants to that. eat. She's like yeah. talking about food, and I'm not fed, and my bowl is empty. <laughs> oh my gosh, adorable. <laughs> yes, that is one of many. Um, so the next one is calcium citrate and vitamin D. So calcium and vitamin work hand in hand together. We need to make sure that the integrity of bones are good for getting mm. less quantity of food we run into the risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis yeah. so making sure we have that in our diet again dosage is going to depend especially for vitamin d how low they are so we need to make sure that we're either mega dosing or just have a basic dose and then um, we need to make sure that the timing in which people are taking their vitamins does not overlap with other ones so you can't take iron mm. and calcium together because that's going to prevent calcium from being um or actually calcium prevents iron from being wow. absorbed appropriately so you have to time it separately so now it's not so much you need to worry about taking all these but you need to make sure that you're taking them at the right time so right. they need to understand this is forever the dosage might vary but you need to be on all this stuff for the rest of your life and that's wow. where I saw people fall off is I'm not doing what I'm yep. supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. There's ways to make it easier. You know, big complaint was like, wow, this is a lot of pills that I have to take after surgery. I have to take one for this and one for yeah. that. And like, <laughs> you probably laugh because you're like, look at my supplement container. Like, oh, <laughs> <Right>. I'm <taking." laughs> Yeah. And there's, there's ways that we, like there's companies, there's bariatric surgery companies that have created multivitamins that have everything in here. But the only caveat uh. comes with like, what if that person is severely iron deficient or what if they're vitamin mm. D deficient because now we're taking a blend that you can't take that stuff out like yeah. you're gonna have to take more on top of that or what if that dosage is too much for you so right. there's great products but you still need to get your routine lab work to make sure that's the right dosage for you I'm exhausted <laughs> there's I wow. mean there's so much there's more there's like protein has to be like their number one priority they need to make sure they're not skipping meals fluid and foods cannot be together like they cannot drink while they're eating meals if you think about like fluid is going to fill up their stomach if they can only eat so much food what's going to happen they're going to fill up super quickly yeah. the order in which they eat their meals protein first vegetables second carbs last like that has to be a priority nothing carbonated cannot drink through a straw like there's oh so God. many things <laughs> that and that's that's why it's like I would rather an insurance company say hey you need to meet with a dietitian for six months right. rather than someone that's in and out of my office and I'm trying to tell them everything that they need yeah yeah, I mean, I can imagine that an hour is not enough time to explain all of that at all. No, at all. I mean, <laughs> it, it's it's with any prof. I mean, it's same thing that you and I do. We need to make sure that our clients are with us on a weekly basis. Yep. That accountability, we know that one time visit is not going to do anything. It's yep. what are you doing in the off hours that you're not with me? Are you sticking to your goals? I mean, right. it goes with anything yeah so I think it sounds like the recommendation like when we're thinking of would this be something that you would recommend to 
anyone to someone who's morbidly obese, of course, it sounds like it depends. And it sounds like there really needs to be, a, someone needs to make a really good choice about where they're going. They need to be mm -hmm. in the right mindset. They need to make sure, to me, in my experience of the people I've seen who've had the surgery and then still are coming to me for weight loss, um, yeah. the mindset isn't there. So oftentimes yeah. I will refer them out to a therapist and if mm -hmm. they can't do both at the same time, fine, go and see the therapist first. Correct. Because if the mindset isn't there, we're not going to get anywhere. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I 100% agree with it. And it's, it's continuing with that. You can't just treat nutrition alone. You can't just treat fitness alone. You can't just treat the mind alone. Like all these things go together. And that's why like this is an interdisciplinary field where yeah. it has to all be together. And it's knowing that you need to show up for yourself and show up after the surgery. We offered support groups. The amount of people that came to them, those were the people that were the most dedicated and the most successful. We would require like, okay, one week after surgery, obviously you have an appointment with your surgeon just to make sure everything went smoothly. One month after, you're not just meeting with me, you're meeting with a surgeon, you're meeting with a psychologist. Every three months, you have a follow-up. It was those individuals that understood the importance of that accountability that yeah. were the most successful. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I think that's what I hear as well is the most common thing that people do not do post-op is one, those vitamins. The vitamins, it's like they go out of the window <laughs> within mm -hmm. the first few months. Like people are yeah. done with it. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is just obviously not going to the support that places like the Cleveland Clinic at least offer. Some of these places don't yeah. offer that. And people are still not doing that because again, pre-op, they didn't have the mindset right. So post-op, they're not gonna follow through. Yeah, correct. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's all so necessary. We know yeah. that. And again, like I've, I've seen amazing success stories from having this surgery. And I've also seen very dangerous effects from this surgery and it really yeah. just it really just depends yeah. there's been individuals that are like you know for the first time I can get into my car comfortably for the first time I can look down and I can see my feet yeah like those are those are the things that are going to motivate someone someone that comes into my office and it's like I just want to drop the weight as quickly as possible and they don't have that motivation in other areas if I want to be a better mother or father right. or like be able to move comfortably drive like those things those are the drive that's what's going to make someone more motivated so that goes back to mindset of are you realistic about your goals and what it takes to get there yeah i you know since all of this has happened and i made the post i've received so many dms and one of them was shocking to me it was someone telling me about a friend who wanted to have the surgery approved by her um by her insurance company and they wouldn't approve it because her bmi wasn't high enough mm -hmm. so instead of her just working on her own and you know doing what she needed to do she purposely gained weight to be approved is that something that you hear a lot because i've seen your face is, mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah i gosh. have seen that um it's not uncommon but what we had to do is we had to have strict documentation every time we saw that client showing the insurance that they were making an attempt to lose weight that would have not flown with the Cleveland mm. Clinic. Like it, it would have not. <laughs> Cause yeah. we, we need to document that. If I see a client that's intentionally not losing weight, they're not going to get qualified. Right. And they need to restart yeah. and try again. <laughs> oh man, we need more people like you out there. I wish <laughs> you were still in the field, but. I, you know. I know, I, I honestly would jump on it in an instant. I, I loved that field the yeah. reason I one of the biggest reasons I liked it was because it allowed me to establish relationships when I was working in general nutrition I would see a client once maybe a few months and that's it when I'm in bariatric care I'm following that client through their entire journey of how many visits they need with me before 
going through the surgery, seeing them on the after side of that surgery, like that was a neat process. And yeah. that's why I got into the this field that I am now working one on one with people, seeing them on a weekly basis, because I can genuinely help people, you know, I can genuinely be in contact with that person, see their body evolve. And that right. to me is, is the greatest blessing of all working in this field. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit because we had a sure. few questions that were submitted by uh, some of my followers. So I want to make yeah. sure that we get to those um, before we get we before we run out of time. So one question that was submitted was, does it really hit the reset button or is it an easy way out? So it depends on what they what they mean by reset. If they're meaning reset on like comorbidities, I'm assuming that's what they mean on like comorbidities yeah. and stuff like that. It will decrease someone's risk. Like I looked up some of the facts, like 40% loss of risk for heart disease, 92% lower risk of diabetes, 60% less risk for cancer. Um, if they do currently have diabetes, they're usually in remission for up to three years where they do not have to take insulin. 90% of the patients lose 50% of their excess weight, 80 to 85% remission of sleep apnea and increased fertility. So there are positives from yeah. having the surgery, but a person's risk can disappear if diet and lifestyle are not taken into right. consideration. Right. Because I, you know, if, for example, that two tablespoons of space that they have, if they have mm -hmm. the R and Y, if they continue to feel that, fill that with processed foods, then Correct. now they're just, maybe their risk was improving, but now it's just going back to where it was because they're still not getting the nutrients. And especially Correct. if they're not also taking their vitamins. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. it doesn't stay, I should say, it doesn't stay two tablespoons forever. That's just at first. Eventually they can start to yeah. eat more and more, yeah. but at first it's just two tablespoons. Yeah, because the stomach, regardless, is going to expand, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So, and that's, that's the reason why I think another argument was like, I can eat way more than that. Well, yeah, like mm -hmm. you can now, but maybe not. Correct. In the <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. In yeah. the beginning, it is restricted. That's, that's why someone is capable of losing 50 to 70% of their excess weight. Yeah, because in the yeah. first year, it's very difficult to eat a lot. But it can easily go the wrong way. You can yeah. easily gain back all that weight. Yeah, which that would be awful to go through. All it is. And it is really to, awful you know. to see. Like, yeah. sorry, you just spent all this money and went through all this effort to do this. And now you're right back where you started. And right. that, that is what I hated seeing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I think you kind of touched on this. The second question was, mm -hmm. what are the stats for long-term weight loss? and stats for impacting other health conditions, which I think we kind of mm -hmm. went over. So the yep. long-term weight loss, do you know like how long that is for R and Y versus the sleeve? Or maybe just even in your experience? Yeah, I mean, on average, it usually was somewhere between 50 to 70% within that year. It right. sometimes was, was very rapid and then towards the end of the year, they would start to trail off. After that year mark, it's up to them. Yeah. It's up to them if that continues. Because yeah. now, now it's no longer an effect of the surgery. Now it's on you. Right. Yeah, I think that's the stat that I would really be interested to see. I don't think that any of these studies are following up with people five years Long later, term. even three mm -hmm. years later to see, because a lot of the comments that I had when I went and, you know, checked out who was leaving the comment, they were saying their date was November or their date was February, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, this just happened for you. And I hope that you keep it off. But I'm yeah. talking about people who are coming to me three years later, five years later. I had a lady yeah. DM me 30 years later, you know, mm -hmm. so it can change at any time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I saw people, even when I got out of the Cleveland Clinic, I still had people that would approach me that had the surgery 
weren't taking their supplements, you know, they're just in the same scenario as where they started. Protein is non-existent. They're not weight training. They're not drinking enough water. Like they're back to carbonated beverages. So it's, ah, it's just, it's just one of those things that like, they have to know, they have yeah. to know what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I feel like I've learned quite a bit. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. I'm like, this is so much information. Um, it's I such can't a imagine. cool field. Yeah, it is. It's super cool yeah. because you get to see people, you know, change their lives. And I think mm-hmm. both of us being in this industry, working with people who are wanting to lose weight and make lifestyle changes, we that's what we're rooting for. You know, whichever Correct. route yeah. you take, we're rooting for you. Mm-hmm. Um, we just want you to know the the nutrition the dangers you know, and about risks. the dangers yeah the mm-hmm. risks that can come with it when you're making this life altering decision you know the correct correct yeah it's whether it's surgery whether it's medications that's that's our job that's our yeah. job in the industry to let people know what could happen and yeah. try to find alternatives if that's a choice but we're not, we're not i'm not against surgery i'm not against medication if it's necessary it's just can we mimic the lifestyle that could potentially get you off medication or prevent the surgery in the first place? Right, right. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa. Of course. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you. You've been a wealth of knowledge. Um, Why don't you tell everyone what you have going on? Do you have anything going on? Are you accepting clients? (laughs) (laughs) I will be upset. Uh, Yes, I am planning on hiring an assistant coach first. so I'm, I have a wait list right now. I'm not accepting clients until probably May, realistically, um, unless I can hire someone sooner. But I keep my roster small intentionally so I can make sure that I, I really just dedicate the time and attention to who I have. Um, but if you have thyroid issues, if you have gut issues, if you have hormone issues, that's my jam. That tends to be the majority of the clients that I see, metabolic adaptation, cause from all that stuff. Um, my link to apply for coaching is in my profile at my Instagram page. You're more than welcome to submit an application if I have the availability on my roster. If I have an assistant coach who can take you, absolutely. More than happy to help. Awesome. You guys definitely reach out to Alyssa. She's an amazing coach and she's just a great person with a good heart and she loves what she does and she Mm -hmm. really, really cares. And that's the biggest thing when you're looking for a coach, you're looking for a nutritionist, a dietitian, you want someone who actually cares and she does. So thank you so much. Of course. Thanks for having me. Okay. Hang with me while I do my outro for the podcast. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Worth the Wait. If this episode or any of our episodes has helped you, please consider leaving us a five-star review. Thank you guys again for listening and I will talk to y'all next time. Bye.